Let's uh, give the Lord a hand for being with us this morning. Good morning. How are you guys doing? How are you guys feeling? Who's ready to worship God? Let's stand to our feet. And, uh, uh, this is the second time I'm leading worship in English. Um, so it should be fun. So uh, I just want you guys to be patient with me. I'm a little sick also, but man, I'm here to glorify God and he's been so good to me. So I want you to stand up and let's worship God because he breaks the power of sin and darkness. How many people say amen? amen. All right, let's go. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, let's go. Help me with your hands right here, come on.
Jesus is Lord. I want you to lift up your hands just for a moment. He's worthy of it all. Through the trials, He's been good. Through the hardest times, He has never left us. Come on, let's lift up our hands. Come on, let's close your eyes. Lift up your hands. You're all worthy of it all. Sing it with me. Say, You're worthy of it all. You're worthy. For from you all things, and to you all things, you deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. Oh, let's lift both our hands high and say, You're worthy of it all. Oh, I'll say, You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. Oh, Jesus, for from you all and to you all I think you deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. Let's sing it one more time. You're worthy of it all. Come on. You're worthy of it all. Oh, we sing to you this morning. You're worthy of it all. Oh, Jesus. For from you all I think. And to you all I think you deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. Let's hear only the voices. Come on, say, You're worthy of it all. Come on. You're worthy of it all. Let's lift up our hands. Come on, say, You're worthy of it all. For from you are our things. For from you are our things. And to you are our things. You deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. One last time, let's sing, you're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. Oh, Jesus, you're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of it all. Oh, yes. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Can we put our hands together for Jesus Christ this morning? <laughs> Jesus is so good to us. He has been so good to us. He has been so good to us. This week that you are here this Sunday, this morning, it's a miracle that you're here. This morning, God has given us air to lift up our hands, has given us the ability to praise His name this morning. Because there's nothing worth more than heaven's spirit. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. So your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Tasted and seen of the sweetest of love when my heart becomes free and my shame is gone. Say your presence, Lord. Come on, the shadow with, with all your strength. Your presence. Are you guys ready to sing? Come on, let's sing. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. And Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come on, say, come on. 
Can we close our eyes and lift up our hands? Your presence moves. Your presence moves. Is everything I want, Jesus? Is everything I want, Jesus? If I have your Holy Spirit, I am free. If I have your Holy Spirit, there's peace in my life. I am free of depression. I am free of anxiety. Because I want more of your spirit, Jesus. Because you make a way where there's no way, Jesus. You make a way where there's no way, Jesus. You have been so good. You have been so good. You have been so good. You have been so good, Jesus. Let's sing it one more time. Let's say, Holy Spirit, only the voices come on. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place. Hold your glory, your glory, guys. What our hearts they be for to be overcome.
in the name of Jesus. And rushing wind says, Amen. 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 Put your hands together for Jesus Christ. Come on, let's put our hands together. Come on, come on. He deserves our praise. He deserves our praise this morning. In the name of Jesus. We're going to uh, get ready for our offerings. So get the offering ready. And be joyful when you give. And I think uh, God is going to bless you. Maybe not money-wise, but he can bless you health-wise. He can bless your business. He can bless your family. So let's get ready. Let's pray, Lord Jesus. Lord, uh, bless the people that give to this vision. Lord, uh, bless the people. Bless their business. Bless their families, God. And Lord, as we get ready to give, Lord, it's all about you, Jesus. It's better to give than to receive. In the name of Jesus. So let's get together and let's uh, collect the offering as we sing Waymaker. Waymaker, beautiful work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, and it's who you are. Because you What a blessing, huh? 
so much. Really appreciate you, brother. He's a worship pastor of the church that meets here at one o'clock. And maybe we gotta recruit him here every now and then. <laughs> Amazing job here. Thank you so much. We got a tiny on the profession morning. And uh, it's a blessed time to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Amen. We got some ground to cover this morning, folks. How many of you have been paying attention to what's happening in the Middle East? Just, just a scotch, right? Um, last week, when we were together, we talked about the Valley of Dry Bones, and it was basically the concept that God is bringing his people back into their land, okay? And so we talked about that in detail. I'm going to touch on that just a little bit today, but we're going to be getting into Ezekiel chapter 38, and this is basically the invasion of Israel that we see going on right now. So let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time together. Father God, we love you. We give you honor. We give you praise. We thank you for the sweet worship that we have this morning, God. We pray that that would just resonate in and through our lives throughout the week, and that we can just spend that time with you, God, just to give you the honor and the praise and the glory that you're due. And Lord, we thank you that we can be together as brothers and sisters. We pray that you would speak to us in a really personal and a powerful way this morning, that your word would come alive to our hearts and our minds, God. And above all, I pray that you'd hide me behind the cross, that Jesus would be exalted and lifted up. And again, we give you honor and praise. That's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 I had an interesting couple of weeks. My uh, wife came down with shingles about five weeks ago, and it's been an ongoing thing. And so we've been praying for Esther. She's back in church today. Hallelujah. <laughs> five weeks, man. So anyway, then on, on Thursday... I went to get a cortisone shot. I got cortisone shots before, but for some reason, this one just did something different. And it ended up spiking my blood pressure. So I just about passed out. I was sitting in the bed. All of a sudden, the room started moving. Then the little light on the Cox box started going up and down across the room. I'm going, bro, I quit drink, taking drugs a long time ago. What's up? You know, I actually just felt so weird that I didn't even want to get out of bed, and I rolled over, and I made myself go back to sleep. The next morning, I woke up, which was Friday morning, and I still felt kind of weird. <laughs> I, I emailed my doctor. He said, you know, you should probably go, you should probably call 911. And I go, I'm not going to call 911, but I'll go to the hospital. So I drove myself to the hospital with my beautiful wife, Esther, keeping an eye on me. And I got in there, and so they had me lay back. As soon as I lay back, the room was moving again. I'm going, oh my gosh. And they, they basically said it was like a blood pressure spike thing. And so they were, you know, trying to help me get calmed down and all the things that they, they do to you when you're in the hospital. And then they said, oh, by the way, we looked into your charts, and you had, a, you had MRIs in the past because you had some kind of carotid artery and you had like a little bump on this one area. So we better send you in for an MRI. And I was there for eight hours, okay? And thank God for doctors, amen? amen. But man, it's, sometimes it's just one of those Kodak moments and you're going, reset, <laughs> hello. Anyway, this morning, 
And we're going to do a reset for the, those folks that didn't make it here last week. But we saw that in 37 AD, Israel was attacked. And in 70 AD, Roman, the Roman Emperor Titus destroyed the city of Jerusalem. He basically leveled the entire city and it sent the Jews and they dispersed all over the nations all around them. Some went to the Soviet Union, others went to Ethiopia, but basically they all went out in four directions from their homeland. This actually happened. So it was a nation without a nation, right? Because they, they had lived in Israel for, you know, a long time. And all of a sudden, they have to leave Israel. That would be like somebody coming into Oceanside and saying, by the way, everybody that lives here, how many of you people live here? <laughs> or Vista, or San Diego County. How many people live here, right? You have to move right now. you got to get out of this area. So take a mental note of what that might have been like with thousands of people trying to get out of Dodge. And what's amazing is that God had prophesied that he would bring his people back into their land, okay? And that's basically the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones that we talked about. Ezekiel saw a bunch of bones laying around in on the ground, and God told him to prophesy to the bones. That sounds a little weird to me. Okay, so that, I, I want you to get a mental picture again. I'm, I'm a very visual guy, so you guys know that. You just ate your Thanksgiving turkey. There's bones all over the table. And God says, prophesy to the bones. That would be a little freaky, wouldn't it? Right? I'd be going, hello, prophesy to the bones for what? So anyway, as Ezekiel prophesied to the bones, God began to bring in a vision. And again, it's a vision. Put the bones together. And it says that he put sinews and muscles and everything else on the bones. Then they stood up, and they were a great army. That's Ezekiel chapter 37. You can read it when you get time. But what took place is that God accomplished that word of prophecy as he started bringing the Jews back into their homeland, and it really started taking off about the 1880s. Okay, so that wasn't that long ago, right? 1880s was not that long ago, and God started bringing the Jews back into their own land. And there was quite a disbursement of them. As of 1948, a total of 465,000 had already left all other nations and returned to their homeland. And against all odds, all mathematical odds, Israel became a nation again in 1948. That's a miracle of God. Having a nation that gets totally dispersed, they have no home, then God brings them back home. Then they have a nation again. That has never happened in the history of the world, except for Israel. In 1967, they captured Jerusalem and the West Bank. And in 1973, they defeated the enemies that came against them. Basically, from all four sides around them. That happened in 1973. And Israel defeated them. Again, against all odds, right? When you got enemies all around you, it's pretty hard to defeat them. That's exactly what God did with the people. So it was indeed a miracle of God. <clears throat> Since 1881 to today, there are now 7 million Jews back in their homeland. That's amazing, especially for the size of Israel. Israel is about the size of Rhode Island. How many know that Rhode Island is one of the smallest states in the United States? Israel is about 18 miles across in the, in the shortest area. And it's about the size of Rhode Island. Seven million people are back in the land. And guess what? The devil is not that thrilled about Israel. Okay? And they've been threatened time and time again. So we're going to take a look at some of the prophecies of Gog and Magog. And you hear these words and you're like, who's Gog, who's Magog, what's that all about, right? And a lot of times we have to dig a little bit deeper to find out exactly what it's talking about. 
And I personally believe that there's a really good chance, just saying, there's a really good chance that Ezekiel 38 and 39 could be taking place right before our eyes. I'm serious, okay? Uh, the Bible says that there will be a pre-tribulation rapture. I don't know when that's going to happen. If anybody tells you that they know when it's going to happen, they're liars. They're false prophets, okay? <clears throat> so we don't know. <coughs> Excuse me. We don't know if the rapture is going to happen at the beginning of the battle of Magog and God, or if it's going to happen at the end of that battle. We don't know for sure. All we know is it's coming down. It's getting closer and closer. And what I'm about to say should excite me. Jesus Christ is coming back to the earth soon. Does that get you excited? Hello. Okay, people have been waiting thousands of years for this, and we are living in that time period. It's amazing. It's totally amazing. And the fact that we are in the generation of Israel becoming a nation again, that blows me away. Hello. So anyway, this morning, we're going to look at the prophecies of Gog and Magog, and they're some of the most dramatic prophecies in the entire Bible. The main thrust of these chapters is that there will be an invasion of Israel by a great conglomeration of armies from various nations that will actually attack Israel from the north, south, east, and west. And please understand that Israel is the only democratic nation that is completely surrounded by Islamic jihadists. Okay, now just before you go into the pastor Z's and Arab phobia, something, okay, that's not what this is about. <laughs> okay, that is not what this is about at all. What it's about is that there are different people that have different beliefs. And we're going to be talking about that today as we go along. I love Arab people. I like Arab food. I like everything about Arabia, okay, and, and all of that. But the bottom line is we're going to be seeing that there's going to be some things taking place that are going to shape the world, okay? Ezekiel chapter 38, beginning in verse 1. And it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against God. This is an individual. God is not a nation. God is something different. So we're going to be talking about that as we go. But it says here, Son of man, set your face against God. Of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, I want to stop there just for a minute, because... We're going to do a little bit of history lesson, okay? Are, are you guys okay with history lessons? Okay, so we're going to take a look at some history, and basically it's a story of Abraham and the two sons that Abraham had. The first one was by Hagar, a maidservant. His name was Ishmael, and he is now known as the father of the Islamic nations. Ishmael is the father, the one that basically got it all rocking and rolling, okay? Ishmael is the father of the Islamic nations. Abraham's second son, Isaac, was the miracle child that God blessed him and Sarah with when they were both in their 90s. God told them, you're going to have a kid when they're 90. That would be a little bit difficult for people to fathom, wouldn't it? Oh, <laughs> I'm 69. I'm not going to tell you how old my wife is. But we're not planning on having any kids anytime soon. Okay? We already did that. We already took care of all that business. And the bottom line, if God came and said, Fred, I'm going to give Esther a child. I'd be going, hello? <laughs> you better talk to Esther about that. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, think about it, right? We're, you know, we're... Over 60, I'll tell you that much. But if you were 90 and God said, I'm going to give you a son, you'd be going, there's no way. There's no biological way. There's no medical way. 
It ain't happening anytime in this lifetime. So anyway, so we're gonna look at some scriptures that I wanna I wanna reference to you because then you'll get the big picture of what it, uh, Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac are all about. So we're gonna go to Genesis chapter 16 first. Genesis chapter 16. And again, amazing scriptures that we're going to be reading today. Genesis chapter 16, we're going to begin in verse 1. Genesis chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. Hagar. So Sarai said to Abraham, See now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, she's later called Sarah, by the way. That's why I keep going back and forth between the Sarai, Sarah thing. Okay. And Abraham heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife. And Abraham had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So now, basically, these people are trying to help God out. <laughs> okay? Because she cannot bear a child. So they're saying, you know what? Maybe, maybe God needs our help here. So, great idea by Sarai. She said, I'm going to take my Egyptian handmaiden, Hagar, and let Abraham have her as his wife, and perhaps they'll have a kid. <laughs> Fast forward to Genesis chapter 16, verse 16, and it says, Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abraham. So that is the beginning of the Islamic nations. The beginning. Okay? Pretty interesting. Because up until this point, it's all about Israel. Now all of a sudden, they're trying to help God out. And now it's all about the Islamic nations coming. Just letting you know. Okay? So this is, this is basically a quick history lesson. So then, after the baby is born... And again, Abraham was like 99 years old, okay, 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abraham. And then, as we go to Genesis chapter 21, verse 5, it picks up the story. And, you know, I'm skipping a lot of scriptures here because we'd be here all day talking about this stuff. But I just want to give you a little bit of background. How many of you are thankful that you get a little bit of background? Before the story starts moving ahead. Genesis chapter 21. We are going to look at verse 5. Genesis chapter 21 verse 5. Again. Very intense stuff here. It says, Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Okay, so we see Ishmael coming at about 86, then at about 100, Isaac comes, and that is the miracle child. That's the one that they, they said would never happen. How many of you had friends that, you know, they were told that they could never have kids, and all of a sudden they pop one out? Surprise! <laughs> right? Hello? So, I mean, you get kind of a picture of what's going on here, except these people are 100 years old. Over 90 and over. It's pretty interesting. So, the next thing that takes place is that Sarai is not happy because now she has a son. Ishmael is a son. Now they have Isaac. Now she wants to get rid of the handmaiden Hagar. And that's what we see next in Genesis chapter 21, verse 10. It says, therefore, she said to Abraham, Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. 
So she's saying, he's got to go. She's got to go. They have to leave. Pick it up in verse 12. And again, it says, And in verse 11, the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. He's talking about Ishmael. But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac your seed shall be called. So now he's telling Abraham, do what your wife is telling you to do. Send the bondwoman, the, the bondwoman away with her son because I'm going to do something with your son, Isaac. Okay? And Isaac was basically the son of promise. Okay? So, anyway. In Genesis chapter 22, it gets pretty real. Genesis chapter 22, we're going to look at verse 2. And again, this is God speaking. And it said, I'm going to read verse 1 as well. It says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son. Wait a minute, what, what about Ishmael? Right? Ishmael is not the son of promise. That's what's about Ishmael. Okay? So he says, And God only recognized Isaac as the son, because he's the one that's going to make the seed continue going in the Israeli land. Okay, so it says, Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go into the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. Pretty interesting. So now God's telling his his servant Abraham, to take his son and offer him as a sacrifice. Guess what that is a type and symbol of? God's son, Jesus Christ, being offered as a sacrifice. Isn't that powerful? Amen. And, you know, the first time that I read through that and I got it and it connected, I went, there's something going on here. <laughs> okay? And uh, so you can read at your leisure, but what basically happens is that Abraham is ready to put a knife to the throat of Isaac, and God prepares a lamb, right? Guess who Jesus is? The lamb of God. Powerful stuff, okay? So it all intertwines, it all ties together, and all of that, and by faith, Abraham was tested, he offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son. As far as God said, didn't note Ishmael, noted Isaac as the only son, as the heir to the throne, right? As the heir to the promises. So now if you go to Hebrews chapter 11, and that's why I love going through multiple scriptures in the Bible because it ties the whole thing together like a big jigsaw puzzle. Amen. It really does. So as you look at the different verses, they they all interconnect. It's like interconnecting roads on a highway. Ever gone down a road and you're on one road and all of a sudden there's like five other choices you got to connect on <laughs> and you can't remember what your GPS said and you're not getting a signal and you're like, my phone's not working, what do I do? Okay, you do what God tells you to do, right? <laughs> so anyway, this is, this is powerful, folks. So in Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to look at verse 17 because it speaks of what took place here. Hebrews chapter 11 Verse 17. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. And you know what's amazing? Is that God told him, Go to the mountain, you and your son are going to return. So Abraham's like, Okay, I'm going to go up the mountain. God told me, me and my son are going to return. 
So if there's only a couple of possibilities here. Either God's going to tell me to not offer my son, or after I kill him, God's going to raise him from the dead. That's faith, folks. Hello? Okay? I, I'd be going, uh, God, we have a Houston, we have a problem. Right? And so it's really interesting that Abraham had that kind of faith, the faith of the patriarchs. It said, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. He said, God, whatever. Everything that I got is yours, including my kid. And I'm willing to lay him on the altar. And you know what? In a, in a figurative sense, we need to do that with our children. Don't we? Because guess what? You can't make them become Christians. You cannot beat your children into submission. You're going to be a Christian whether you like it or not. It doesn't work. We all try, right? <laughs> Sometimes I still want to do that to people. Still want to slap them around a little bit. Wake up. <laughs> the bad dream that you're having. You need Jesus. Okay, we can't make them do anything. But we can offer them up to God. Amen? Amen. And I pray that we all do that. Pray that we all offer our children up to God. Okay, a couple more quick scriptures. And we will go back to Ezekiel, I promise. We'll be going back there in just a minute. For those of you that are clock watchers, throw your watch away. I'm kidding. James chapter 2, one more verse before we go back to the stories in the Old Testament. James chapter 2, we're going to look at verse 21. Because it talks about without faith, you can't please God. Here it says, in James chapter 2, verse 21, it says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Powerful verse, because it took a lot of faith to do that, right? And we need to pray that we'll have that kind of faith as Christians. That God will help us to be willing to do whatever he calls us to do. And sometimes the things that he calls us to do are a little bit difficult, right? So go back to Ezekiel chapter 38. And again, we're going to take a look at Magog. And it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against God of the land of Magog. Now, is that the first time that the Bible talks about Magog? The answer is no. It's actually in Genesis chapter 10, verse 2. So let's go over there for a minute. We will go right back to Ezekiel and just let you know. But it's interesting because, you know, when you see all these things tied together like a jigsaw puzzle, you go, wow, God is radical. <laughs> because he spoke about it here, then it goes into this situation. So Genesis chapter 10 actually talks about the table of nations. In Genesis chapter 10, it talks about genealogies. We're not going to get all into the genealogy thing, but in verse 1 it says, Now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and sons were born to them after the flood. Verse 2 is where it talks about Magog. It says, the sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Medai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus. Interesting. Okay, so that's the first note of any place called Magog in the Bible. Very interesting. And these are the nations after the flood. And again, it's called the Table of Nations, Joseph. Josephus, or Josephus, was a Romanized Jewish historian from the first century, and he noted that Magog were a nomadic band of people known as the Scythians. How many have ever heard of the Scythians before? Okay, and you know, they got the scepter, they got all that going on, all that in a bag of chips. And they were a fierce band who lived in the northern regions above the Caucasus Mountains. Can you do me a favor and pop up that one slide? Because now we are, it's starting to connect here. See Israel in the middle? Okay, go directly north. 
You hit God, go to the right a little bit, you hit Magog. Guess what that nation is known as today? Russia. Nobody knew that, right? A couple of us, my wife knew that, a couple others in the room that have heard me teach this before. They, they, they said, wow, what is Magog? What, what's that all about? So anyway, Magog, you could almost take a map of Europe and take a pen and a ruler and go straight up from Israel all the way up north and you're going to hit Magog. That is Russia, folks. And the reason that that's interesting is because right now they're being attacked and it's being fueled by Iran. We already know that, right? Hamas is involved. Hezbollah is going to get involved. Other people are going to get involved. Guess why? Because they all have the same distorted belief system. Now, the problem that I have with this is when our government decides to give them money. Amen. Amen. Why are we arming our potential enemies? That, does that make sense to anybody else in the room? No, it shouldn't, right? Why give money to your enemies that want to destroy you? Amen. That makes absolutely no sense to me. So anyway, while we're at it, let's take a look at God because God is basically an individual from the land of Magog. So if we broke it down, you might say that it's like the czar of Magog. Guess what his name is today? Mr. Putin. Okay, interesting. Okay, so as we see this stuff here, it says, look at, look at what it says in verse one and two here it says now the word of the lord came to me saying son of man set your face against god against azar if you will in the land of magog so azar and russia god is setting his face against that that's pretty powerful isn't it and, you know the first time i saw that i was like oh no and i, I got a hold of this book and if you ever get a chance to read this book, it's called Epicenter. And in 2000, I, I've been a Christian since May 5th, 1977. And I started hearing about Magog and Gog and all this other stuff. And I was like, what is it? Inquiring minds want to know. So I started digging. And I started finding out more and more and more information. And I was getting totally blown out, blown away by it. And then this guy comes out with this book called Epicenter. And it talks about what happened in like 2005, and it calls him Tsar Vladimir Putin. Hello, 2005, or 2004 in the Boston Globe. The Boston Globe was calling Putin a Tsar. Then it goes on, it, I mean, it just keeps talking about all this stuff. Uh, this is December 16, 2004, Omaha Herald. Putin sets Russia on its fascist path. It goes on and on. The Empire Strikes Back, 2006. A confident Kremlin is throwing its weight around. Associated Press, 2006. Russia, Russia's Putin reclaims dominant role in the former Soviet Union. Well, I thought Russia had got broken up and they were gone. They were dissolved. Guess what? They're back. Hello. <clears throat> Pretty interesting stuff. So as you track through all these things, you're going, wow, I think I see this happening in our lifetime. This is pretty freaky, right? Anyway, as we pick it up, then it says, it talks a little bit about the Prince of Rosh. This is actually where the name Russia came from. Rosh, okay? And again, like a Title, a czar, a dictator of the land of Magog, the land of Russia, and coming soon to a theater near us. Then we're going to pick it up in verse 2 again. It says, Son of man, set your face against God of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O God. The prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Verse 4, I will turn you around 
put hooks into your jaws and lead you out with all of your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Now it gets crazy. Look at what verse 5 says. It says, Persia. Up until 1935, Iran was called Persia. Just thought I'd let you know. Does anybody else see the picture here? Okay, so we got God, we got Russia, now we got Iran, and they're all going to be working in concert to try to destroy Israel. <laughs> and again, it sure looks like it's coming soon to a theater near us. But guess what? God is going to defend Israel. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? God is going to defend Israel. So what the devil means for evil, God's going to turn around. He's able to do it. He does it in our lives, right? Amen. What the devil means for evil, God is able to turn it around. Praise God for that. So here it says Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them. So again, want to put that map up again? Yeah, so you see Libya is called Put, Egypt, we see Persia, which is Iran, we see Togarma up there, we'll talk more about that later, we see Meshach over to the left, right above Israel, and again, Israel is a little dinky country, and all these Islamic nations are going to go against it at the same time. Pretty intense, right? Guess what? The Bible says those who bless Israel will be blessed. Those who curse Israel will be cursed. So, Mr. President, if you can hear me, Amen. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of advice. You may want to be blessing Israel instead of cursing them. Hello? Amen. Just saying. Probably a good idea, right? Okay, Meshach, Tubal, all these names... They think they really mean nothing to us until we take a look at a map like that. <laughs> and we see what the nations used to be called that are now in those areas. And it sure looks like it could be possible. Hello. Just possible. Okay, here we go. So it says Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them. All of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops. We're not talking about Gomer Pyle. Just making sure you're awake. <laughs> okay. Gomer and all its troops, the host of Tagarma, from the far north with all its troops, many people are with you. And I want to read something to you real quick. Because the countries mentioned here that will be involved in an all-out assault against Israel in the future include most of the Muslim countries in the surrounding areas, including Iran, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya, and the Muslim countries in the southern part of the former Soviet Union, conspicuous by their absence are Iraq, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Egypt, who are all traditional enemies of Israel. Okay, so for some reason those nations are involved in all of this. But we'll find out more as we go, right? So here it says, again, in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 6, it says, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Tagarma from the far north, and all of its troops, many people are with you. Verse 7 says, Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, like they all came from different nations, back into their land. You guys are tracking with me, right? Okay. And then it says, and now all of them dwell safely. Israel's been pretty much safe for quite a while. Okay, a few bombs here and there. Now it's hundreds of rockets are flying. 
It says, you will ascend coming like a storm. How many of you guys remember the name Desert Storm? Hello? Okay. So, again, a lot of this has types and symbols, and you're like, well, the dots are connecting a little bit here. It says, you will ascend coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God, on that day it, will, it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind, and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and to take booty. Now, we're not talking about the booty that the rat was talking about. Okay, I'm just yeah. making sure you're over. Oh, wait, still. Okay. I, I have to throw in a little, a little comedy every now and then just to make sure that you're still awake, right? Anyway, so it says to take plunder and to take booty. That is material wealth from the land, right? So when you have a lot of booty, it doesn't mean what you thought. It means that you have something valuable. I just, I can't help myself. Anyway, it says to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. Then it goes into verse 13. It says, Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take plunder, to take great plunder? So, Many Bible commentators believe that Tarshish is a reference to England and perhaps the United States are the young lions. We can't be sure. Okay, it's interesting. But if that identification is correct, then England and the U.S. will object to the invasion, <clears throat> but they won't get involved militarily. Perhaps because our hands are already tied up with other battles and other wars. I want you to think about it. You know, no matter how much light, no matter how much news is shed on Israel, you keep hearing about money going to the Ukraine. I'm not saying that it shouldn't. I'm not going to get into any political dialogue in that realm. Okay, I believe that we need to help people. But well, we also need to make sure that the money is going to help people. Yeah. And it's not just go and pay somebody off. Just saying. I'm kind of a weird guy. Sometimes I can see a little bit of weirdness going on, and I'm like, hello. Somebody's up to something. Yeah. Okay, verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to God, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, Will you not know it? Then you will come from your far place out. Then you will come from your place out of the far north. You and many peoples with you, all of them riding horses on horses, a great company and a mighty army. Now, a lot of times we read things about horses and we're like, well, that's talking about tanks and armored personnel carriers and all that. We don't know. All I know is that when there were countries that got invaded previously, and what's interesting is that some of the wars were actually fought on horseback, <laughs> okay? I, I, I remember seeing things about Korea getting invaded and all of that, and there were horses, okay? And I'm like, that's interesting, as you look back in history. So it talks about horses. We don't know if it's talking about tanks. We don't know what it's talking about. All we know is that there was a prophet a long time ago. He saw all this stuff, and he tried to describe it as best as he could. Right? I want you to think about that just for a minute, right? Because if he saw conventional weapons and stuff in his vision, he would have been going, what is that? Okay? And the book of Revelation is like that as well. 
You know, you see a lot of symbology, you see a lot of different things, that if you were a prophet living in those days, you wouldn't know what to call it. Anyway, in verse 16, it says, you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O God, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them. And again, God is talking to Gog again. Interesting dialogue here. Verse 18, it says, And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken, surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, and steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against God throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. How many have ever heard the term friendly fire? Okay, friendly fire is not that friendly. <laughs> okay, basically means you're in a war, you're in a conflict, and all of a sudden, all kinds of crazy things are happening, and you start shooting your own guys. That's not a good thing, right? Here it says, every man's sword shall be against <clears throat> his brother. Interesting. And it says, and I will bring him <clears throat> to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Amen. You know, God's <coughs> plan is going to be magnified by natural disasters. The Bible says a great earthquake. When God says a great earthquake, you better believe it's going to be a great earthquake, right? Yeah. How many know that, right? God would say an earthquake. He wouldn't say a great earthquake. Great earthquakes are beyond that. God will interrupt this invasion by what I see here in the text, by earthquakes, rain, hail, and fire, and brimstone. There will be confusion, an ethnic strife will break out. Every man's sword will be against his brother. The result will be, thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. God will save his people and get everyone's attention. Right? Powerful stuff. So, I want to point out just a couple of quick things. In 1973, when the Syrians attacked Israel, because again, you know, we, we read these things and we're trying to figure it all out. How does it all work? In 1973, when the Syrians attacked Israel, they were supplied by Russian Soviet MiG fighter planes with Russian pilots. 1973. Okay, because we're going... Wow, Russia's going to be Israel? Did they ever do that before? Yeah, they helped Syria attack Israel in 1973. Who knew? The conflicts in the Persian Gulf War 
could very well be what precede this war, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Iraqi Freedom, all of the above, right? That all preceded what we're getting ready to see taking place now. And like I said, God is going to do his thing. He is going to change the landscape of what's going on. We're going to be reading more about that next week. Lord willing, and the rapture doesn't happen. <laughs> okay? We'll be reading again about Ezekiel chapter 39. But again, I want you to understand that on May 5th, 1977, I got radically saved. I started studying biblical eschatology. Some of you guys are thinking we're talking about the study of French nails. Okay? Eschatology means the study of last things. The end times. And I started making a scrapbook in 1977. In fact, Esther got to see the scrapbook that I was making back in those days. And it was all about the end times, the end of the world, everything that's taking place. And yet what's amazing is that, boy, I could sure add to that scrapbook now. I was cutting things out. And newspaper lines, headlines. <clears throat> Okay, look at Russia's arms and nuclear sales to Iran, top $4 billion. Their nuclear arms that they've sold. And some of you guys remember a guy named Mahmoud Abinadab. How many remember him? A little short guy, I think I could take him. I don't know. <laughs> I would like to have tried back in those days. But he, he was the president of Iran, okay? and. The, the weird thing about this guy is he had a very strange theology. He was a Shiite, and he actually believed that he was a predecessor to the 12th Iman. The, and we're not, we're not talking about IP man. Some of you guys have watched the karate shows. We're talking about an Iman is like a prophet that comes in the last days. Okay, so Abinadab thought that he was the predecessor to that guy. And it's interesting because the last ruler of Islam, whom some Bible believe Bible scholars believe could be an antichrist type symbol, but this guy, Abinadab, had been invited to the UN toys. He stated that Islam is ready to take over the world. He said, Islam is the savior of the world. They called Israel the little Satan. How many remember that? And they called the United States the great Satan. What that tells me is that they hate our guts too. Not only are they going to go after Israel, sooner or later, they may come after us. He believed that he could usher in the 12th Indian by starting a jihad against Israel and the U.S. Look at what we see now happening on college campuses. It's insane, folks. It's insane. People are rising up and going, death to Israel. Leave the free Palestine. Do this, do that. Okay? Sounds a little bit reminiscent of some of this kind of talk. Okay, and I'm not saying that they're all evil and they're all going to hell. I'm saying that they need to get saved and they need to repent of their sins. Amen. Just like everybody else, right? Amen. Hello? Anyway, the current president of Iran is even worse than Abinadab was. He is also a Shiite Muslim, meaning that he's very extreme. He continues to be a terror. His nickname is the Butcher of Tehran. Pretty intense, this is the president of Iran. This is what we're up against now, folks. So, what's, again, as we look at all these things that are going on, we need to pray. Hello. <laughs> this is not rocket science, folks. We need to be praying. We need to have our eyes wide open to what's going on on the news. And I don't just watch Fox News. I watch all kinds of crazy news. I actually watch Al Jazeera every now and then just to see what they got to say. <laughs> just to get their opinion about things. And it's really intense. Okay, Al Jazeera is the basically the Arab-type news, right? 
It talks about his uh, jihads and whatever else going on. And I got to tell you, the future looks very bleak if you look at it from their perspective. If you look at it from God's perspective, God wins. Amen. Amen. And Israel will still be here after all those other nations are destroyed. Amen. That's all I know. And News 11, <laughs> next week, Ezekiel chapter 39. Let's pray. Let's ask God to bless our study of his word and that he would just embed these things into our hearts and our minds. And we'll have the worship team come up and do a closing song. But let's go before the Lord. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for opening our eyes. And you are so faithful to do that. And Lord, I pray that you would prepare your people, God, for your return. Above all, that we would know that we are safe in you. Know that we are sealed in you. That we don't have to worry about all these things. We just have to continually put them back in your hands. And so, God, we love you. We give you honor. We give you praise. I pray for every single person that's in the room. I pray that they would be right with you. That they would surrender to you. That they would continually ask you to wash them clean from their sins and to make them new creations. And so if that's you this morning, if you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, just slip your hand up. I'll pray for you wherever you're sitting. If you say, you know what, Pastor, this kind of stuff is a little bit freaky, but it could be a good thing that God is getting my attention. And you want to just ask Jesus to help you. Just draw closer to him. Just lift up your hand. Let me pray for you. God's going to move. Those who want to join me in this prayer, Lord God, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you have a plan that is greater than the plans of this world. And Father, I pray that you help prepare me for your kingdom, God. That you would wash me clean of my sins. That you would write my name in the Lamb's book of life that you would do a work of your grace in me and through me. Help me to be an end times warrior for your kingdom, that I would stand and be bold and tell others about you and point others to you. Lord, we love you, we give you honor, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to seek a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to the Lord. Can we put ourselves, can we um, stand up and let's sing this? I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory.
We're going to see victory in our families. We're going to see victory in, in our jobs. We're going to see victory in our health. Thank you so much for bringing us here, God. Lord, as we uh, start a new week, Lord, we're going to see your powerful hand Lord, over our lives. Thank you so much for bringing us this morning. And Lord, we bless uh, the people that came today, Lord, and Lord, take care of them that they have an amazing week. In the name of Jesus, and we all say, Amen. Put your hands together for Jesus. Amen. I think we're done here. Right? We're done here, Pastor? We're done. All right, have a good week, guys. God bless you guys. Yeah, that map looks crazy. And, and where they all went, went so.